so good to be able to worship together with you and to offer up our lives to God even as he's offered up his life to us. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, it's the cause of Christ. It's the person of your son. It's the proclamation of the life that we share together in him that brings us together, that draws our hearts together in worship and adoration and love, but also sends us out in service, in dedication, so that the life that we have received in Jesus could also be the life that we share with others. And Lord, we admit that there are times when we feel nervous and we hesitate and we feel scared and not sure how to talk about our faith in your son. But Lord, when we step back and see who Jesus is and what he's accomplished for us, God, we find the courage to speak for you. And so, Lord, we thank you for bringing us together, and we pray that to that end, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a family in our neighborhood that when they park their cars, maybe like some of you, they prefer to back their cars into their driveway. So typically they'll pull down the street and they'll put it in reverse and they'll back up into their driveway. And, and I see their cars just about every day when I'm walking in our neighborhood. And what I love about that is there are two practical benefits that I see right away when I see them pulling their cars back into their driveway. The first one, like some of you, it's this is the smart way to do it. Because when you do that, it takes a little bit more effort to get in the space. But once you are parked, when you have to go somewhere, the grocery store, to school, to meet a friend for coffee, to go somewhere, that you have a quick and a safe exit out of your driveway. But then this family also has a second benefit. And that benefit is evangelistic. They use this opportunity to share their faith in Jesus Christ with others. So when I walked by their house earlier this week, I took a couple of pictures of their cars. They have three cars parked on this wide driveway that they back into. Here's a picture of the first car. Jesus Christ is the answer. I love that. It's, it's, they are communicating the, the faith of believers that we share together. That Jesus Christ is the answer to our greatest problem. But there's also a second car that they have parked in their driveway. It's a nicer car. John 3.16. And if someone walks by, and we know that people are biblically uninformed in our generation... So when signs are held up, John 3.16, they think, hey, John, maybe you should call your mom at 3.16. They don't know what John 3.16 is. But for those that don't know, there's even text. For God so loved that he gave. And we know the entirety of the passage that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I have never met this family personally. And you have never met them either, in all likelihood. But don't you feel connected with them? Don't you feel like we are aligned together, that we are two peas in the same pod, that we're in the same pocket of faith, that we may not know who lives in that house or how old they are or what they do for a living or the hobbies that they have, but walking by their home, we know without a doubt that they value their relationship with Jesus as their personal Savior. In fact, they treasure their relationship with God as their Father, with Jesus as their Savior, with the Holy Spirit taking up residence within their life, that they are so committed to their faith that they want to be conversational with others even in an inanimate way, such as putting this sign on the front of their cars. 
I don't know who they are, but I feel connected with them. I understand what they value, and more importantly, who they treasure. When the Apostle Paul pulls out his pen, corresponding to a church that he's never met, I mean, he, he, he knew many people, lots of churches, that he was instrumental in launching their ministries and leading individuals to faith in Christ. But there was a solid community of believers at the Church of Rome that he had heard about, that he had prayed for, that he had longed to see and to, to be a part of their ministry and to see the grace of God in operation within their lives. But he had never met them personally in the same way that I've never met these neighbors personally. And he connects with them on the basis of their shared relationship with Jesus Christ. He talks about their identity and he talks about their responsibility. He describes himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, that he's set apart to the gospel of God, that he is chosen as an apostle to the Gentiles. He speaks to the Roman believers that he's never met as those who are loved by God, that they are called to be saints, called into a relationship where they choose holiness, not sin. And so Paul establishes camaraderie and a, and a connection and an identity with the believers that he has never met firsthand on the basis of their shared relationship with Jesus Christ. And the language that he uses in the first chapter, not only speak about our shared identity as followers of Christ, as servants of the gospel, as those who have been loved by God and called to holiness, but he also speaks about our responsibility that we have been set apart to the gospel of God that you and I are uniquely qualified to talk to our classmates and our friends and our neighbors about what it means to have a life that matters today forever. To have a relationship with God as our Father on the basis of Jesus becoming our Savior. And when all that happens, the Holy Spirit takes up his residence within our lives to give us power and strength to live our lives in a way that honors him. You see, they simply wanted to say, our neighbors, that Jesus Christ is the answer. That John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's a, a simple message with a powerful effect. It is easily communicated, but it dramatically changes not only the course of our everyday decisions, but even the course of our eternal destiny. Through his own example, the Apostle Paul impresses you and me with this truth. That sinners are delivered by our God when saints are driven by his gospel. That's what was moving Paul literally to want to go to Rome. That's what moved his heart to be intentional and conversational and even courageous to talk about his faith in Christ. You see, sinners are delivered by our God when saints are driven by his gospel. And if there's one thing that's hard to convince someone of, it's that they are a sinner in need of the gospel. I mean, unless we've done something horribly wrong, unless someone has pointed their finger at us and said, you are terribly guilty, you deserve to go to prison, even more, you deserve to die. I mean, unless we reach that level of guilt, very few of us would identify ourselves as a sinner, as someone who's separated from God and deserving of his wrath and judgment. We might say we're not perfect, but don't you call me a sinner. But sinners are 
who we are and where we stand apart from Jesus Christ. And in the same way that it's hard to convince someone that they're a sinner and hard for me to fess up the thought that, boy, apart from Christ, I am a sinner deserving of his judgment. In the same way, it's hard to latch on to the idea that we're a saint. I mean, you know, wow, you do something for me or I do something for you and you respond back and you say, well, you're a saint. And it's like, whoa, don't get carried away. I'm not like St. Paul or St. Peter or, you know, I'm not someone who's going to pontificate, you know, great spiritual truth. Don't, don't enshrine me in that language. You could say that I'm an okay person or I'm thoughtful or I'm generous, but don't call me a saint. But in the same way that we are a sinner, and that's where we stand, Apart from Jesus, a saint is who you are because of what Jesus has done for you. And on the basis of your faith in the Holy One, the perfect, sinless Son of God, that we experience a radical transformation from the bottom of our foot to the top of our head, inside and outside, That we are no longer guilty as a sinner before God, but we are declared innocent as a saint, as one who is holy and set apart to God. And sinners, who we are without Jesus, are delivered by our God when saints, who we become, on the basis of our faith in Jesus, when we are driven by the gospel of his one and only son. God powerfully rescues all who trust in Jesus as the gospel courageously moves all who serve with his power. And so the title for today's talk is Driven to Deliver. Because the fact of the matter, whether you're in elementary school or whether we're in high school or college or that's been a long time and we're a young adult or a middle-aged adult or a senior adult, whatever our age, the reality is that we're all driven to do something. That's why we wake up. We're driven to study. We're driven to work. We're driven to relate. We're driven to create, to, 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 to bake. We're driven to, to play golf or to learn a new language. We're driven to work on our skills when it comes to our musical abilities or even for our Toastmasters to, to come before others and to learn how to communicate before others. That every one of us, just by nature of being alive, is that we are driven to do something that we are motivated to to use the opportunities that God has given to us to tap into the resources that are at our disposal. And for the Apostle Paul, he is driven to deliver the good news of Jesus to anyone who will listen. Because he understands the magnitude of his responsibility. He understands the gravity of of the opportunity that we have to to change our eternal destiny on the basis of how we respond to the offer of God in the person of Jesus. And Paul is driven to deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ because he knows that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And that as he and as we faithfully deliver the message to others, then God, by his grace and mercy, will deliver people from his wrath and from his judgment. You see, the ultimate dream of the Apostle Paul is that he would not only be faithful in delivering the truth to others, but that he would collapse in overwhelming worship as he sees God through his faithful delivery deliver others to faith in his one and only son. And so moms and dads and boys and girls and all of us, one question I want us to 
to latch our thoughts and our hearts around today relates to courage and to confidence. And the more courageous we are for the gospel, the more clearly we will communicate the person of Jesus with others. And so the question is, how can we become more bold in our conversations about Jesus? And that could be praying for boldness. That could be practicing conversations with people about how to maybe give people a reason for the hope that is within us. Maybe it's, it's studying the Bible more and reading helpful Christian resources or tapping into YouTube channels that strengthen us and solidify our confidence in the gospel. But what are some ways that we could become more bold in our conversations about Jesus? And I think one of the best ways is not only to know the Word of God, but it's also to practice the Word of God. Because when we move beyond being intelligent or smart or theologically sharp Christians into ones that are practicing what we preach, then that gives us confidence to tell others what we believe. That it's not just, you know, ideas and a lifestyle that we recommend or a person that's worth following, but it's someone who is significantly affected the way that I live. And that gives us courage and conviction to communicate with others. And so I want to thank Auntie Faith. Thank you, Auntie Faith. And for all those that serve with you to help our youngest students, both here in person as well as online, to understand what it means to live with boldness for Jesus. And for everyone else, I'd like us to turn in the book of Romans to the first chapter. Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 8 to 17 this morning, and I want to thank Rachel Lee, who's the daughter of very good friends of ours, Steve and Nancy, uh, lives up in Minneapolis. And Rachel, from her very early age, I don't know when she started, she might have started when she was four or five, six years of age, but she is a remarkable artist that she really chills and relaxes and refreshes herself through her artwork. And Stevie shared this on social media, and I reached out to Stevie. I said, Stevie, could I share Rachel's artwork in celebration of the Lunar New Year? Stevie said, oh, man, that'd be so cool. And he got Rachel's permission, and she's a high schooler, 14 years of age. I said, how long did it take Rachel to do this? She said, seven hours. Just in her spare time, just for fun, this beautiful work of art. And so as we look at Romans chapter 1, verses 8 to 17, I'm not sure how I'm going to tie this into the tiger, but it's tiger-like courage that, you know, we want to have as we proclaim the gospel to others. That'll preach. That works, okay? And we're going to see in verses 8 to 15 that like Paul, a gospel-driven eagerness seeks opportunities for mutual ministry. When you and I center our lives on the gospel, when the truth of Jesus moves us physically, emotionally, spiritually, it'll literally move us to seek opportunities, kingdom-sized opportunities to talk about Jesus with others. And then in verses 16 and 17, We're going to hear how a God-centered boldness leads individuals to saving faith. And as the gospel drives us, what drives us is the fact that the gospel of God is the gospel that comes from God. It's the gospel that leads us to God, and it's the gospel that centers on the person of God. And a God-centered boldness If we speak about our faith, just as someone else spoke about the faith to us, then it'll lead individuals to saving faith in Jesus. And so when we embrace Paul's perspective 
in viewing ourselves primarily and chiefly as a servant of Christ, doulos Christu Jesu, Paul, servant of Christ Jesus, people that <laughs> don't know me from Adam, that you've never met me before, the first thing and the most important thing I want you to know about me is that I am a servant of Christ Jesus. And so we'll understand with that mindset how a gospel-driven eagerness seeks opportunities for mutual ministry. Let's take a look at verse 8. First, I thank God. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. That without ceasing, there's not a day that I don't think about you. There's not a, a moment of my life where I'm not mentioning you in my prayers. Verse 10, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. You know, students of the New Testament tell us that the form of Paul's letters were the conventional form of his generation. So Paul, in writing the letters to the church at Rome, the church at Corinth, to his protege Timothy and Titus, that he is literally, as it were, using the template of his generation that would start with a greeting about the sender and the recipients and a greeting and usually a word of thanks about the recipient and then offering a prayer to the gods. And what Paul does is while he taps into the convention, the template of his generation, he literally drenches it with the gospel of God. It's not an ordinary letter. It's spirit-influenced. It's Jesus-honoring. It's God-focused. And I think in the same way that you and I live our days just like everyone else, we live in the same place, in the same community, in the same campus, in the same marketplace, in the same neighborhood. But we're not just living a life that's same as usual, but it's to be saturated and influenced by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul strongly emphasizes his own personal connection and commitment to the God who set him apart to the gospel. Look at the possessive. He says, I thank my God. God is my witness, the God whom I serve with my spirit. I mention you always in my prayers. What Paul envisions for us as a collective congregational community naturally includes our own relationship with God. And that tells me that when my relationship with God is flourishing, when your relationship with God is vibrant, when your understanding of the gospel is advancing, where it's not simply the gospel or the God or the prayers, but it's my gospel. It's my God. It's my prayer. Paul helps us to see that the health of our community really pivots upon the health of the individual. And what Paul gives praise to God is he says, Man, I haven't met you firsthand. I've never been to Rome. You don't know me from whoever. But boy... I have heard so much good stuff about you. Your faith, your reputation goes way ahead of you. I hear about your love for each other. I hear about your dedication to share your faith in Jesus. I hear about even in the midst of persecution and ridicule that you hold on to your hope. You, you don't have a false hope or you're not hopeless, but you have a real hope. Something that's anchored as Elder Neal shared with us last week. Paul says, 
I can't wait to be with you. I will be so flabbergasted. I will be so blown away because you are spiritually like this. Because when everyone talks about you, whether believer or not, they are blown away. They are touched. They see the impact of your lives. It's like when someone meets you for the very first time and you introduce yourself to them. So, oh my goodness, I've heard so much about you. And our thoughts are always thinking, I hope you heard good stuff. And when they begin to say, you know, when I say, well, what have you heard about me? And they begin to say things like, oh, I heard that you are such a good baker. Or I heard that you're so, such a good athlete. Or you're, you're an amazing musician. Or, or you are so creative. Or I hear that you are so people focused. Or I hear that you are so talented in this way. Or I hear that you are so thoughtful and generous. That, that if there's someone I could ever look to to, to, be, to have a shoulder to cry on. Or to hear a word word of wisdom, that you're that person. And that's what I want for us. I want people to say, wow, they, they meet you and they, they find out that you're connected to the Bread of Life Church in Torrance, just down the block from Costco and Amazon. And they say, well, you're part of the Bread of Life Church? Wow. And it builds their database of, of people that are making a difference for the kingdom of God. And they may not have that vocabulary, and they may not even know the things that you know, but they know that you're a good person. They know that you're trustworthy. They know that you're compassionate. They know that you keep your word. They know that you are willing to sacrifice. They know that you are set apart. And they may not have the vocabulary that you're a saint, but they recognize that you're different, which is what a saint is all about. Paul has heard so much about what others are saying about the Romans the men and the women and the students who are not only believing in Jesus, but they're behaving like Jesus. They're not only preaching the gospel to others, but they're actually living out the gospel. And Paul says, man, I just want to be in one place. And I've been praying hard and often that God would make it possible for me to be with you. And that's why I've been praying nonstop. That's why I never stop mentioning you in my prayers. And loving the fact that he could correspond with them. He says, you know what? There's no substitute for being there. For face-to-face -face interaction for being able to share a meal and to enjoy a worship gathering, to, to be able to open up the truth and to, to embrace each other in our faith. Not simply a virtual experience, not simply corresponding and, and sending a letter to them, but he says, God, I want to be with them. And called to blaze new trails for the kingdom. This pioneering evangelist, pastor, missionary, church planter, apostle, servant of Christ, says, I serve God with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And I looked at that. And I thought, isn't that what it means to be a servant of Christ? It means that we serve God in my spirit, with my whole heart, in the gospel of his son. 
Talk about a mission statement. Talk about an epitaph for a tombstone. Talk about a way to introduce to someone, introduce yourself to someone that you've never met before, that I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. And what that means is that I serve God with my spirit. My spirit is synchronized with the spirit of God so that I could serve God with my whole heart in my spirit. In the gospel of his son. And while the Apostle Paul, without a doubt, I mean, one missionary journey, two missionary journeys, three missionary journeys, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Corinth, man, a -a one-of-a-kind apostle. And while there is no one else like the Apostle Paul, Paul doesn't want to separate himself from us and think we could never be faithful in our stewardship of the gospel. But that even as a servant of Christ, that just like the Apostle Paul, he wants us right here in the month of February 2022, in the midst of our life here in Southern California or wherever you are, that we would faithfully serve God in our spirit in the service of his gospel, in the gospel of his one and only Son. That is, we serve our Father by cherishing His Son. And so when we understand, and and when I am gripped by the call of God, and when you are driven and compelled by your identity as a servant of Christ, then we will also, like Paul, serve God with our spirit in the gospel of his one and only son. Dane Ortland is a pastor outside of Chicago in Naperville. And he recently published a book called How Does God Change Us? And he says, growing in Christ, the focus of our spiritual formation conference a couple weeks ago with Dr. Thomas who, Lord willing, will be back with us in 2025. Growing in Christ is not centrally improving or adding or experiencing, but deepening. Implicit in the notion of deepening is that you already have what you need. Christian growth is bringing what you do and say And even what you feel into line with what, in fact, you already are. In other words, Orland's saying it's not a matter of getting more. It's not a matter of saying, God, just give us this one more thing and, and we're good to go. But as Paul wrote the church at Ephesus, God has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, through his Son, and by his Spirit. And just as Ortland writes, that's why Paul will often say, you know, it's not a matter of getting more, but it's getting more of what we already have received. That it's understanding what God has already blessed us with and brought into our lives. And that's the vision that occupies the heart of Paul. Take a look at verses 11 and following. This is why Paul says, you know what, it's not enough to just communicate over the distance. It's not enough to send you a letter. I want to be with you. He says in verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Probably a a way that Paul is communicating the benefit of the exercise of his gift. He's saying, God, I want to I use the gift that God has given to me and to be a blessing, to be a benefit, to build you up in your faith. But then he says, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. That is, Paul's not thinking of it as a, a one-way ministry, but he's saying, you know, when I go there, 
I'm going to build into your life, but also I want to be on the receiving end so that there is a reciprocal, mutually beneficial ministry that we experience together. Verse 13, Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I've often intended to come to you. It's been on my schedule. It's been on my calendar. I've actually mapped how to get to your place. But thus far, doesn't get into the details, have been prevented. But I want to be there in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul looks at his life as a kingdom opportunity. He taps into his schedule as a stewardship of the gospel. He thinks of people around him as the platform for ministry, where they could be used of God and where they could use their God-given abilities and their resources and their experiences to be a blessing to one another. And when I read through this passage, I, two words came to mind that really capture the essence of authentic, God-honoring, Jesus-elevating, spirit-moving community. And those two words are mutual encouragement. Those two words are shared ministry. Those two words are fruitful harvest. Those two words are collective blessing. Those two words are a lasting impact. Mutual encouragement, shared ministry is what he's looking forward to. Fruitful harvest, he's thinking of, of God at work through his one and only son by the power of his spirit. A harvest that will bear much fruit to God's greater glory. Collective blessing. It's not just Paul using his gifts and a blessing them, but it's seeing the Romans use their gifts and being a blessing to him as well. It's a lasting impact. Paul has tried, he's been frustrated. He's made plans. They've had to be canceled. He's raised up his hopes only to have them dashed. It sounds like life in the pandemic. But he doesn't give up. He says, I've tried. I haven't succeeded. I've mapped it out. There's been a roadblock. There's been desires that I have to, to see you in person so that we could bring glory to God together. But it hasn't happened. And he says, I'm not quitting. I'm praying hard. I'm praying often. I'm trusting God that somehow by his will, he's going to create this opportunity. And that is very much life in 2020 and 2021. And 2020, 2022. There's a lot of 20s. As we plan, it's frustrated. We hope and it's dashed. We map out and it's frustrated. Paul says, don't give up. Mutual ministry, shared benefit, lasting impact. Language is a funny thing. If I talk about an obligation, I talk like this. It's my obligation. It's something I have to do. It's part of the job. It's part of the responsibility. But I don't really like it, but I have to do it.
But if we talk about something with eagerness, <laughs> you know, our voice gets up, you know, raised up. We get animated and we get excited. And an obligation is something you have to do. But eagerness is what you feel when you get to do something. Like go to Disneyland or Bread of Life Church. You just can't wait to go. Obligation is preparing for a colonoscopy. If you're on the younger side, that's just something you don't want to do. It's funny how we separate the two to put them mutually exclusive. But then you take a look at Paul's words, and this is what just knocked me over. Take a look at verse 14. I am under obligation. What he has to do, responsibility, indebtedness, colonoscopy preparation. But he says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. A barbarian is not someone walking around naked. A barbarian in their day is someone who didn't speak Greek. So in our church, it'd be Mandarin and Barbarian. I would be a Barbarian because I cannot speak Mandarin. It's Paul's way of saying, hey, you know what? I am under obligation to everyone regardless of their ethnicity. Regardless of their education, both to the wise and the foolish. The educated, the trained, but also the layperson. The everyday individual. And this is the connection. So I am, did you get that? So, thus, that is why I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. As a servant of Christ, called to apostleship, set apart to the gospel of God. Those are all terms of obligation, responsibility, vocation. Paul affirms that he is obligated to proclaim the truth of Jesus. But that doesn't mean it's... I don't like doing it. It doesn't mean he's forced to do it. It doesn't mean he's backed into the proverbial corner where he's held hostage unless he does it. His sense of calling, his being set apart to the gospel, his being chosen as a mouthpiece of God, his obligation actually fosters his eagerness. It's because he understands who he is that he says, man, I get to preach the gospel. I get to talk about Jesus. I can't wait to go to Rome so that I could give you the gospel just as I have given to other people in other places. So for the Apostle Paul, obligation and eagerness are not mutually exclusive, but they're directly related. It's because of the obligation of a called servant of God in the gospel of his son that Paul says, man, I have no other course of life that I would rather live than to live eagerly telling other people about the gospel of Jesus. In other words, telling others about Jesus is not only a duty, but it's also a delight. It's not only a sheer responsibility, but it's a sacred privilege. It's not only what I am compelled to do as a chosen person of God, but it's what we're privileged to do as a child of the King. And sometimes I think renewing our minds is a process of, of getting our minds out of the sense of obligation means I don't like what God desires me to do. When God calls, he changes our hearts so that the very things that maybe we might dread or fear or 
recoil at are actually the very things that we eagerly volunteer for and step into. That quote from Packer that I've shared before, we never, we never, we never move on from the gospel. We move on in the gospel. It's not, oh, I know it, and that's good. But it's, I know it, but I need to know it more. I understand it, but I need to pray for deeper understanding. And that's why Paul in Ephesians will preach and then pray. Will preach and then he'll pray. Because when he gets theological, he gets doxological. When he gets into explaining what Jesus has accomplished for us, he says, man, I've got to just stop right here, and we've got to stop and pray. Not because it's over, but because it's so deep. And it's not just for a library, but it's for a life. And so that's why Galatians and Philippians and Ephesians and Thessalonians and every letter of Paul is this interchange between who we are in Jesus and what that means in terms of our life. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. When Paul says, man, I want to go and I want to preach the gospel in Rome. And we think, well, why does he need to preach the gospel in church? Because not everyone in church really knows the Son. And so, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, even among the churched, the religious, the regulars, even proclaiming the gospel among the churched will lead some to initial conversion. You hear the story, someone's been at church for years, they grew up all their life, and it's not until then that things began to click. And when they really think they believed in Jesus as their personal Savior. And a lot of times that happens to those of us that have grown up in church. That it's not until later in life, maybe high school or college or even in our adult years, where we begin to realize that it wasn't just simply the stories or the passages, but it's a relationship with God through his one and only son. And so we've got to keep preaching the gospel and talking about the person and the work of Jesus, even among the churched, because some will come to initial faith. But proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, even among the saved, will motivate everyone to ongoing sanctification. That is, becoming more like Jesus, growing deeper in our faith, happens in the same way that Paul modeled his ministry. He didn't say the gospel on this, but he says, this is the gospel. Let's go deeper. Let's unwrap it. Let's mine the jewels. Let's appreciate the wonder of what it represents. And so Paul can't wait to go to Rome to preach the gospel. Amy Joseph and her husband and her family live in San Diego, and they work with a college ministry called Campus Outreach. And she talks about how God works through the entire body of Christ. She says, every need is not a call. In order to live faithful lives, rather than frantic lives, we must learn the sobering truth that every need is not a call. Our God is so multifaceted that it takes the entire body of Christ, past and present and future, to display his fullness 
And I think of Ephesians chapter 3, how God reveals the multifaceted wisdom through the body of Christ. As such, each believer reflects some sliver of the beautiful character of Christ. Some hearts break over sex trafficking, while others beat for the right of the unborn to live. Some believers are fueled by meeting physical needs, while others delight to train minds. And she writes, the more we understand the way that God has wired each of us and identify the passions that ignite our hearts to prayerful action, the less likely we are to run around frantically trying to address every need. And I appreciate her perspective because Amy Joseph is saying, while it's not just looking at the church, it's not simply looking at our present age, but it's looking at the body of Christ, past, present, future, here in North America and in every part of the world. And how God is demonstrating his power and saving and rescuing those who believe. And it's in the power of God that we see the righteousness of God. And I think Paul has the same global, universal perspective that Joseph is talking about. Because coupled with a gospel-driven eagerness that seeks opportunities for mutual ministry, Paul shows a God-centered boldness that leads individuals to saving faith. Verse 16, Paul says, I'm obligated, but I'm also eager. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he's saying, you know what? I realize that when I talk about the gospel, that people are going to push back. But Paul says, that doesn't intimidate me. Because it's the power of God that saves those who believe. When Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he says, he understands that we live in a pluralistic culture that says, hey, anything goes to God. He understands that we live in a relativistic age that says, hey, who are you to say this is absolutely true? Whatever is true for you as an individual is just for you. And in that type of environment, it's easy to get pushed into irrelevance, to be bullied into silence and fear. But Paul says, the power of God it's so awesome that it rescues people from the wrath to come. That it delivers people from eternal judgment. That it saves people for his kingdom, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of his beloved son. And like Paul, when we grab hold of the fact that the gospel is the power of God that could do just that. Not only reroute someone's eternal destiny, but reframe their everyday decisions. That we're not going to back off in fear, but we're going to step up with boldness. Because it's the power of God for salvation. Verse 17, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, and quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel exhibits God's power because it expresses God's righteousness. And God's righteousness is our standing before God. That we're innocent, forgiven, a child of God on the basis of our faith. 
But it's not only our standing with God, which is a legal, forensic thing, but it's also our walking with God. And that's why Paul will talk about that in chapters 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and all the way through the book of Romans. That our standing in God ought to influence our walking with God in holiness and obedience. So that those who are declared righteous will also make decisions for righteousness. And this faith that we have is pivotal to the gift of righteousness that we receive. And so that's why he says it's righteousness from faith for faith, literally out of faith unto faith. Some translations say by faith from first to last, from start to finish. That is, our initial faith in Jesus will necessarily lead to ongoing faithfulness to Jesus. The righteous is who we are. We shall live, no longer dead, but alive in Christ. And that is by faith, initially by faith, but also continually in faithfulness. Let me ask you a question. If you could do one thing, money is not a barrier, talent is not really an issue, but if you could do anything, what would you do? What is your dream job? And last week, Helen and I were part of a leadership gathering with some very dear friends. And Helen kicked off our time together with this icebreaker with that very question. What's your dream job? I mean, don't worry about talent. Don't worry about money. I mean, what would you do if you could? And the answers surprised us. They humored us. And they intrigued us. Here's what some people said. Psychologist. Chief of staff of the president. Race car driver. Someone like-minded, CHP police officer, so that they can go as fast as they can without getting a ticket. Someone who would lead a shelter for animals, tender in their hearts. A basketball player, travel blogger, a lawyer advocating for children's rights. Someone wanted to be a singer like Celine Dion with her own headliner show in Las Vegas. I mean, what would you want? What would be your dream job? What's absolutely mind-blowing is we don't have to wait. You don't, don't worry about money. Don't worry about talent. Because God's already given us everything that we need to speak for him, to represent his son. And so the question is, is our human spirit synchronized with the Holy Spirit to serve God and the gospel of his son so that our obligation is our eagerness, what we love to do. Because as the gospel courageously moves us to serve Jesus. Our God powerfully draws individuals to trust him. Because sinners are delivered by our God when you and I, saints, are driven by his gospel. Let's not be ashamed. Let's go bold and let's go strong. Father, I pray for anyone this morning who is maybe still putting it all together about what the gospel is and about who Jesus is. And maybe it's beginning to, to click. And I pray, Father, that you would lean even more closely to them. And that they could offer up a prayer that says, God, I believe and I understand 
that I am a sinner. That's who I am without your son. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins so that I could be forgiven and that, wow, that I could become a saint, one who belongs to you. And so I believe in Jesus. I trust in him. Father, that's our dream, that you could use us to use our lives to deliver your message and to see you deliver them by your son. And we pray this in his name.